I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, we've got Trent Langhoff for part two. Trent's still in the house. Yes. Uh, we, uh, we've super enjoyed our conversation so far with you, Trent. And we, we told in the last podcast that Trent was with us for 10 years and is a gifted teacher and preacher. So like that part of your ministry for us was such a blessing for WFR. But then, mm. of course, we got to be your church family while your kids were being born. You know, and then so the relationships that you have continue on with Absolutely. you. And that's why when, when God opened this door for you to go to Colorado, as much as we all miss you, of course, and it was sad. I mean, we cried. You cried. We cried. Oh, man. But at the same time, we know that the kingdom is a big place. It's and a, so, I mean, look, it, it, I figured it out when, so here recently, I guess about a month ago, I came and visited Trent in Colorado. And so he lined up me speaking at his at his church men's group, and I on the last podcast I made some references about sometimes I'll try to be funny and nobody laughs. laughs. Well, when I spoke at Trent's uh, church men's group, the cricket button I should have brought this. <laughs> that was funny because it was, and I realized there's a cultural chasm. In between Colorado and Louisiana, Colorado's not Louisiana, <laughs> and my jokes were not. The chasm was so great that you couldn't go from one to the other. Luke sixteen, <laughs> <laughs> and I realized though in that moment that uh, you know the Lord uses us in different places and Amen. in different cultures, and uh, and most of the words that you use in your vocabulary, I'm pretty sure they understand what it is. They get it. Most of the ones in my simple vocabulary didn't get it. <laughs> I was undereducated, but uh, it was so great having you. The church really loved you. Trace Church is awesome. Well, the second speech, I made an adjustment and just thought, you know what? Let's just stick with Jesus. Yeah, and uh, and so I, I mean, look, it's the well the, part of the part of the struggle for Trent here, from my perspective, is being his one of his mentors as well as yeah. one of your shepherds yep is that Trent had was super gifted in two different areas i mean he went to school to be educated to be a counselor and do counseling centers and yep. exercise those gifts but he was also a gifted speaker and so therefore and loves to preach and teach yep. so how do you do both those effectively those are both big jobs yeah and so you 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 walked that razor's edge here with yes. us, and it was difficult because yes. it's, both of those are so time consuming. By the way, you're also raising a young family, right? You know, and so that's the difficulty. You know, when you have a lot of different gifts. So to get to now do what you're doing, I knew it wouldn't be long before you'd be teaching somewhere. Uh, and you're a well, teacher. Have you ever right? seen a culture right now that needs counseling with Man. whether it's oh, mental illness or true. gender identity? Because you've done a lot of stuff on all that, which is uh, you know, oh, Trent, I, I heard, a, Trent did a seminar before he left, not a seminar, but a class series before he left here. The best stuff I've ever heard about same sex attraction, gender yep. is so good. In fact, I, I got you did you like an eight week yep. study. Remember, I came to you so and said, good. We need to write a book together. Yep. And yep. we never figured out how to do that because I was, you know, I'm a little bit, I'm like, Well, just trust in Jesus. <laughs> There's still time. But uh, still yeah. Time. <laughs> But it was so good because I thought that this is where we're at. I mean, I always go back to the same identity thing about when what God gives you that we take for granted is when you know where you came from. I mean, if you really uh, in the overtime, you talked about actualization, but mm -hmm. that you actually are a created being yeah. from the creator. Well, that makes you just automatically feel a lot better about yourself and why you're here. And, you know, Acts 17 says he determined the time set for us and the exact places Amen. where we should live. And he did this so we'd seek him and reach out and find him. I mean, it kind of you're like, oh, I'm not an accident. I'm not junk. I, right. th there, there's a purpose here. And then when you acknowledge what you're doing here that I can use no matter what's happened to point to Jesus and represent him or therefore God's ambassadors as though as though god were making his appeal through us and then when you realize where you're going we're talking about eternal life i mean how much has luke been about the true reward of eternal life in jesus well all of a sudden you're just feeling a lot better no matter what's happened you're to exactly you exactly right Jace. It, it's a it's an identity that's wrapped around 
answering life's biggest three questions. How did you get here? What are you doing here? And how are you leaving? That's it. Well, and selfishly, and it's never really selfish. I mean, I, my vision, Trent, for you, whenever I first met you and then we got the opportunity to work together, was that our Celebrate Recovery, which at that time had been around for about 10 years, yeah. was really making a huge impact in our community. And we were starting to have these homes that people were moving to yeah. from all around the country. Absolutely. But the hardest thing was how do we get out of the mindset of – just a 12-step program that helps get you to a better place to really being locked into Jesus Christ, who's the ultimate Savior, right? And so I felt like your story and your experiences, as well as your expertise, would be the perfect guy to transition. And you you were. I mean, to me, looking back on all the great things of you and your family being here— that the bridges that were built from that, yeah, that by, that by the way are still amazing. Now we that. can't even in the little roomy where they had to move over to the <laughs> big room, That's awesome, you know. And then so you helped us figure out how these folks wow. can go with some counseling, with some understanding of the traumas you're talking about, because almost everybody that's in there has something similar yeah. to that, which is why they turn exactly. to drugs, alcohol, or whatever. Yeah. That's why Trent. Uh, that's why I pursued a relationship because. You know, disp- most of the time when I start hearing psycho babble, you know, my <laughs> eyes roll back in the right. back of my head, and I'm like, what, what, what do you say? But you, because of your story and what happened through Christ, you know, you kind of taught me that it's not about the program ne- necessarily That's right. if you don't understand the programmer. And I'm right. going back to Jesus and all these little, these little witty sayings. It's not trusting the process there's a processor mm-hmm. it's not necessarily the plan it's the man you right. know in all of that you always have had a way to point people to jesus through all this because ultimately that is our refuge which is right. what that, we talked about in the overtime that's exactly yeah. right yeah. exactly and i think that's what separates you from being a counselor from being a counselor who's using the ultimate counselor absolutely to really heal people. And it is interesting, you mentioned that from John 14 or in, through 16, is that that is a word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit. That's absolutely Isn't that incredible? Was that's why I'm like, counselor. Yeah, that's yeah. People yeah. Say, what about all this counseling? Right. I'm like, well, I believe in at least one. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that and, we all desperately need. And, right. and I love that's it. Right. In the overtime, you used an illustration from Matthew 27, 32 about the the man who carried the cross. That, oh, no, that was good. I think we should relive that just for... I think we should just get, since since not I mean, everybody has overtime. I know you're going to tell your story. Yeah. We left off, look, when you were 10 years old, which is, which is horrifying, that you're using drugs for the first time at 10 years old, which is where we left off in the last, last podcast. But you did say something that I'd never thought about before. It's here's Jesus who did all these miracles, and then he gets to the cross... He's well, carrying he, it. He could have performed a miracle to himself by carrying his cross. Why would he allow someone else to carry his cross? And and you made your point of, and I'll let you make it because you did it better than me. Yeah, I, I, I think Jesus could have healed himself and carried the cross. He raised Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus had been dead four days. He he gave sight to people who were born blind. Um so I, I don't think it's that Jesus could not carry his cross. I think Jesus allows himself to be so brutally beaten and fatigued to need help carrying his cross. Again, not to show us that he couldn't carry his, but to demonstrate for us that there will be times we can't carry our own burdens in life by ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it is totally okay uh, to reach out for help. If Jesus can get help carrying the cross, we can seek help carrying our own burdens. That's, That's so a, important. It's a great point. And ultimately, he did all that for us. I mean, he... That's right. He led the life and ended in death that we should have received for no matter what's happened to us for our own selfish right. moments and our, you know, separation from God. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think that that whole connection connection point is really why God has used you the way he has, you know, which I think is a great blessing for us. So I want to pick up on the, on the story where we left off because yeah. we didn't do that in the overtime, but obviously you were introduced to drugs. You're young. We understood why it's the trauma that led you to this point. That's so right. where did where did that take you? It in was those tough. young yeah, years. Well, was and tough. your family had had 
separated. Oh, you didn't mention right, that. Right, right. That was part of the trauma, right? Correct. Yep, yep. So, so early life trauma, used drugs for the first time at age 10, started using drugs full time shortly thereafter. And um, I mean, were you doing this at school? And, before yeah. school, after school, leaving school, sneaking out at night, you know, any any time I could get a hold of a psychoactive substance, I was trying to get a hold of one. And were you like stealing money to do stealing this? Stealing money, lying to people, deceiving people. And it got to the point where my substance abuse was so severe, I dropped out of school uh, as a junior in high school. Mm-hmm. And so basically was uh, using drugs all day, every day. You were probably 16. 16 at the time. And and you guys, I, I was just miserable. Yeah, I was broken and hurting. And again, like we discussed in the last podcast, my brain learned that drugs eased some of my emotional pain. And so my brain just kept going back to that place over and over and over and over again. My parents eventually... Uh, heard about a treatment center in Arkansas uh, that was supposed to be good. It was Christ centered. And so one night they uh, found me and said, Hey, we want to take you to get something to eat. And I passed out in their vehicle and I woke up the next day, having driven across state lines and find myself at this uh, treatment center. And so it's a long story, but over the next two and a half years, I'm in treatment eight different times. And so you're in, you're out, and, you're in, yep. you're were out. Were you like breaking out or were they giving you? So that's a funny story. It, it's sad, probably more than it is funny, but it does provoke laughter. I guess it's that pity laughter that we <laughs> talked about earlier. Uh, so I'm in a tr- uh, uh, sexual abuse trauma treatment center outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. And I was 17 at the time, so I'm too old to stay in the pediatric unit, but I was really too young to be with the adults, but they put me with the adults anyway. And I was in a really low spot in life and was suicidal and uh, was a suicide risk and had been harming myself. And so they had me sleeping in the center of this ward where I was under, you know, constant surveillance essentially. Um, And one morning I woke up and there was a girl Uh, who looked to be about my age that was sketching a picture of me, which is kind of, you know, creepy in retrospect, but given the setting, it didn't seem that, you know, unusual. (laughs) Um, And so I befriended her and her story was similar. She was too old to be in the pediatric unit with the kids, but really probably too young to be with the adults. And she shared her story with me. And, you know, these details are kind of graphic, um, but they're worth sharing just just so your audience can understand the transformational power of Jesus Christ. So she told me that uh, her family was prostituting her out to fund mm. their drug habit. Mm. And that's why she was in treatment. And they said that she would be uh, released into the custody of those same family members when she finished. Mm. Which was really sad. I'm kind of like in this place in life at that moment where I couldn't take any more bad news or tragic uh, uh, circumstances. You're hanging by a thread. Barely by a thread, Alan. Yeah. So when she told me that, um, it just occurs to me like, we got to break out of here. I don't want her to go back to this family. I don't like being here. Um, She doesn't like being here. And so uh, true story, one night during shift change... Um, we jimmied open a door to this psychiatric unit and escaped from the mental hospital. So Mm. there was a time in my life where I was an escaped mental patient, which that is kind of the titular line. That's funny. Um, (laughs) so that was on the, I used to love using that line when (laughs) when he became our preacher. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) You know, his preacher was, you don't find that too much on the high end resume. Let's, uh, let's take a break. (laughs) So you got two kinds of gifts in the world, Jace. You got oohs and you got ohs. Hmm. Which which would you rather get at Christmas? You know, if I just get one, I'm happy. <laughs> so Dad got the ooh when he uh, got some Tommy Johns last year. Actually, got a wow from Miss K. Which, As I walked by, yeah, I didn't stop. <laughs> I walked by, yeah, Good. he just walked by, sporting his brand new Tommy Johns. Good. 
uh, which we love Tommy John's. I was a huge fanatic about Tommy John's uh, long before they became a sponsor of the podcast, but we are glad they're sponsors of the podcast. Not only do they have awesome underwear, they have great loungewear, pajamas, a lot of great gift ideas. They've sold over 20 million pairs. They have thousands of five-star reviews. Giving Tommy John is a holiday tradition. 97% of women and men love getting the gift of Tommy John. Uh, they don't have customers. They have fanatics. And they also have a best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free, guarantee. So they stand behind their product. You'll love it. We all love wearing them. Uh, even Zach. Uh, we got him in some time. You, you love him, don't you, Zach? I do. So we buy him. So we're like everybody else. We're going to go to TommyJohn.com slash Phil right now for the holidays. You're going to get 25% off site-wide, which is great. 25% off everything for a limited time at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. That's TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. Welcome back. Um, Zach is back with us. Zach, hello. We're so glad you could join us. It's good to be back, guys. I got I got the tail end of what you guys are just talking about. Super powerful. Trent, Trent, good to see you. Dash, so good to see know, you, my friend. Yeah, we're a long ways away. So when Trent, my, so just to let the audience know, when Trent was uh, was preaching for us at WFR, Zach and his family were here then. They've yeah. been in North Carolina about the same amount of time, maybe a little bit more. And um working with our college age kids at that time and obviously working in ministry with us. And so you guys worked a lot together as, as much as anybody. We were super close. One of the best experiences of my uh, teaching uh, career, Zach and I got to teach through the book of Romans together. Oh, wow. Oh, it was yeah. during a time our church was really going through like some deep soteriological. Oh, oh I see why you and Zach went. <laughs> see what I did there? See what I did there, I love Dash? that, man. <laughs> it's good to have you here, <laughs> Soteriological. <laughs> what was that? What were we going through? Yeah, just people kind of talking through how a person comes to be saved. Well, so let's just say process. that. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, I think we like soteriological Zach, in better. Your absence, I, I, I do. Jason's I decided do. that any <laughs> word that won't fit on a Scrabble board, which is seven letters, uh, is not bad for the dictionary. Whatever you, whatever you do, do not say eschatological. Eschatological. <laughs> eschatological excuse yeah. me, I can't even say it. They, that's Don't what I'm that. saying. It, it, it just, it's I was, I was blind, Zach, but uh, your man here. <laughs> oh, he was more than that. That's right. <laughs> he was. That's exactly yeah. right. All right. So, so, so your escape uh, mental patient, because because I've heard your story, so I know that yep. where this ends. Obviously, it ends well because he's here. But that's right. So, I want to hear how you got from there to a better place, because that's that's. Uh, it's a just an interesting thing that you go through all the elements of life when you're living, no matter where you are. I don't care where you are, who you are. But when you talk about it now, I'm not hurting for once being blind. I'm yeah. not hurting yeah. because of that. I just, I just feel better. Well, you've been healed by the, I, by the really my from point. a spiritual perspective. That's because yeah. some people would be listening here, and I mean a lot of people, which listen, which can be listening to this. They may wonder why do they seem to be cheerful in talking about these horrific times. There's one thing to be sinful and get tangled up in that and all that, like the girl you saw. But the other thing is, can you ever get to a point with God and Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and you say, they can laugh about it now. They can. It's not that we're not taking it seriously. Yeah, right. It just. It doesn't have a. Well, one of the. It doesn't have a lock on us to where we we never do get over it. Well, one of the fruits of the. I mean, you had to get past it, right? Of the Holy Spirit, which is the ultimate counselor, is peace and joy, and so. I think makes you realize how how powerful it is, and thankful is that that there is a Holy Spirit. Exactly. But look, I know why. It's because Trent takes, just like you, Dad, or me, take no glory in it. The glory belongs that, that, to God. That, that, and we're right. basically making him give this story. Because <laughs> he exactly right. spent the first 10 minutes talking about Jesus. Because it really is God's story that changes us. But you mentioned the book of Romans. This is the same line to use on Dad. 
Paul didn't start in Romans 4. Mm, that's right. I mean, it mm. would have been so much more pleasant had he done that. Mm-hmm. But he started with Romans 1, 2, and 3, which is a tough read. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's the read we're talking about here. It's the living the life. It's the shameful things. It's the So the re, you don't really understand what God has done unless you understand where people have been. So I think that's the power of it. And, no and, and it helps other people. You mentioned this in overtime. It's... We become light when we understand the life. Absolutely. That we submit. I mean, our joy now, I don't want it to be mistaken for uh, there really really wasn't that bad out there. Right. Oh, it, it's pretty it bad. It was horrific. Bad. It was horrific. Yep. We got it. Yep. So you're out right. on the run. With the- so, yeah, was out on the run with this gal, homeless, you know, in the French Quarter of New Orleans, which is a terrible. Rough, uh, whatever you're saying next, I know it, it you know. It, yeah, it, and I, I, you know, I'll survive. I'll, I'll, I'll spare your audience from the. By the way, I hit my bottom in the same place. Oh, that's that is ironic. Wild. It is ironic. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so um, was experiencing everything you can imagine that a homeless person might experience in New Orleans and a lot you probably couldn't imagine. And eventually this gal's family found us. I had a conversation with them, felt like I had probably not received the most accurate information from this young lady. And, um, you know, they took me back to treatment. And so... A long story short, I ended up back in my hometown and and started using drugs again after being in treatment for almost two and a half years, eight different times, and used drugs really hardcore. I was an IV drug user uh, for the next almost four years. And at my rock bottom, um, I weigh about 250 pounds right now, but I would like to say my body mass index is a lot different than Zach Dasher. We're, we're close to the same weight. Same well, way. You did wait. You did wait till you, uh, till you get right. to allow us to leave I've been waiting to deliver that line. I've been waiting to deliver that line. Let me translate that. Yeah, same right. weight, different shape. No, right. we're not, yeah. I'm not 250, guys. Come on. <laughs> You're looking good, Dash. You're looking Thank good. Thank you, brother. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, was I, I weigh about 250 pounds right now, and I weighed about 120, you know, when I was at my rock bottom. And wow. I was using with people that had HIV and was sharing needles. And it was just really as bad as it could have been. And and you live through it, you know. And so the you were pe- facing death. I mean, no question. At this point, yeah. it's certain death. Certain death. Yeah. My, my best friend OD'd and yeah. passed away, right. you know. And so the guys of the people I was closest to, there's only one person that's also alive. And it's really sad, you know, just young kids who are hurting and broken. And we live in a world where those, those kinds of kids are vulnerable and there are more than enough people willing to take advantage of them to, to just lead to the most unimaginable misery possible. So I hadn't seen my family in, in many, many months. I'm at my rock bottom, weigh 120 pounds, was so dehydrated. I couldn't salivate even to eat food. And, um, I, I I get a phone call. This is at, I'm almost to year uh, 19, December 2nd of this year. So this will have just passed by the time this podcast is released. Is my 19th year in recovery. And I got a call from my mom's sister. I love uh, my aunt and my mom's family is just awesome. And she called me and I don't exactly remember the conversation, but after we had just a real brief conversation. I hung up the phone and I blacked out in an overdose and I come to in the driver's seat of my car and I'm about a half mile from my mom's mom and dad, my mom's mom and dad's house, which is where my aunt was staying. And I black out again and I wake up, I'm on, I'm on their front lawn and in an active overdose, they um, nurse me back to health. I survive and the, a couple days later, I is Sunday, and they asked me to come to church, you know, with them. And so I went to church. Um, it's the church of my wife's grandfather. It's my wife's grandfather's church. He was the lead pastor there at the time. And my wife's grandfather's brother, my wife's great uncle, was preaching this day. And he was preaching a lesson um, from the book of Jude called Being a Contender for Christ. And he was using this illustration 
of Mike Tyson. And he's like, you know, you look at who Mike Tyson is in the ring and he looks like he's a contender, but you look at his life outside the ring and you realize he's a pretender, you know, he's hurting and broken. And what he does in the ring is kind of like a cover up for that. And, um, I thought to myself, Oh my word, that's me. Mm. You know, I have always felt like this just scumbag junkie, loser who's trying to pretend like he's anything but that mm. and i'm desperate to to be a contender you know i don't want to be a pretender anymore and about the time that thought occurs to me the preacher looks at me dead in the eye it's like if you're a pretender and you want to be a contender i want to pray over you today i want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes and so there's probably 200 people in this auditorium three maybe and everybody bows their head and closes their eyes. And you got to remember, I, I had just come through an overdose. I got, you know, black fingernail polish on. I looked really bad. Mm. And he says, if you need prayer, I want you to raise your hand. And it was like suddenly, miraculously, a hundred balloons had just been tied to my wrist. <laughs> it just started and coming my up. My hands just starts coming <laughs> up. Yeah. And seriously, it was you're so, probably fighting to yeah, push, yeah. push Alan, it down. That's right? true. I mean, it's I, not I, funny. No, but it's, it's just, not. But yeah. I, I, it, it surprises me. And I like look at my hand, you know, as it's raising. And I was surprised. And so I like looked at my hand and then I looked at the guy who was preaching and he's locked in on me again and my hand's coming up and he's like, if you are raising your hand for prayer, I would like for you to come forward so that I can pray for you as God is my witness. It's like something supernatural compelled me to get up out <laughs> yeah. of my pew that day. Mm -hmm. You were convicted. It, I was, man. And I, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is real. The convict, the convicting power of the gospel is real. And to get to the front, I had to stand up, make a right hand turn, go to the very back of the auditorium, make a second right, and then a third right, and come down the aisle of shame, you know, the center aisle. I couldn't make it easy. <laughs> oh, man. You had to do the full route. That's exactly. Hang on, let's take yeah. let's take yeah. our second break. So it's the end of the year, so we're always kind of looking ahead to uh, financial decisions, kind of things you want to be doing in the new year. One of the things you may want to think about. Uh, is one of our sponsors, uh, Samaritan Ministries. Lisa and I have decided to, uh, to switch to these guys, and uh, we've been members for a couple of months now. Uh, it's part of the Christian community, and what they do is it's not insurance, it's assurance that you're part of a health care sharing community. Uh, when you have a medical need, fellow members are going to send money directly to you to help you pay your medical bills. You're going to do the same for them, all while praying and encouraging. And Zach, we were on the phone the other day getting some information or giving them some information and the woman on the other end of the line had prayer with us uh, mm -hmm. before we got off the phone and I've never had that experience and it was fantastic. Uh, that's so that's awesome. another great reason to check these guys out. There are no networks which put you in control of your family's health care. You know what's best for them so you choose the doctors and hospitals you go to and have a say in the treatments they receive. Uh, you can join today, um, or you can start um, any month that you choose to once you call uh, and sign up. It's a biblical solution to health care where we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And it's also much more affordable. Whether it's a broken bone, unexpected diagnosis, or other medical emergency, you'll find comfort knowing you're connected to 80,000 Christian households across the nation who stand ready to care for one another spiritually and financially during a time that you need it the most. Become part of this community today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. Join up today. You had to do the you had to do the roundabout. I've seen that before to, to get down there. Yeah. So then what happened? So make a uh, few right hand turns, and I come down the center aisle. And um, when I passed the threshold of where my parents were sitting, I looked at them, and they looked at me. And the second our eyes met, I just broke down, bawling. And they later on they would say they thought I was getting up to leave the service. And when they saw me walking down the center aisle, they thought it was a miracle. My mom actually started saying, this is a miracle. Oh, my God, this is a miracle. 
and the the preacher comes down, prays for me. Um, I surrendered my life to Christ that day. Um, and an interesting part of the story, my cousin, a really great guy, was actually moved by the Spirit to go forward in his church a handful of miles away that same morning and pray for me. Wow. So wow. Um, there was a lot going on in the spiritual realm. A lot realm. going yeah. on in the spiritual realm. And I relapsed on a drug December 2nd of 2004. That was in 2004, about five days later. And at that moment, I just thought, uh, I'm never going back to this ever again. Yeah. And so I've been in recovery since December 2nd of 2004. My, my life has looked so different. You know, since then, my my bride, so we met in May of 2005. We were engaged December 17th of 2005, six months after we had met. And then we were married. So this is a year after you've stopped. After I, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. So met her six months after I got sober, was engaged a year after I got sober, married her a, a year and a half, May 20th, 2006, after I got sober. And she's beautiful. Um, Kirsten is just uh, she her her outer beauty is really incredible. But she is the most loyal, kind-hearted, innocent, supportive, nurturing um, woman on the planet. And it's just so crazy to think a broken, messed up loser like me can end up with a, a gal like that. And I really do think that that's God's favor. Yeah, you oh, know. No, yeah. No no doubt. She's and she's incredible. I got three awesome kids. Um, we were just hunting with Jace this morning. It's like his son killed his first wood <laughs> killed duck. his first oh, wood wow. duck today. Yeah, uh, pictures to prove it. But you know, I, I I really don't deserve a second chance. I don't deserve the opportunities God's given me. Um, and I do think it's important just for your audience to hear stories like this, because I, like we said last time, there really always is hope. You know, Joel 2, mm -hmm. the Israelites are in captivity, and God tells the Israelites through the prophet Joel that he will repay them for the years the locusts have eaten. Mm -hmm. And that's been my story, guys. You know, I, for over a decade, I was just living the most miserable, sin-filled agonizing life. And I really do feel like God has, um, repaid me for the years. The, the locusts have eaten, you know, and I, I, uh, all I have done, the only thing that I've had to do to get to live the life that I'm living, which it really is my dream come true is surrender to Jesus Christ every single day. Well, just yeah. two words. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> one day, one day it may be in a movie, right? <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah. So, be so careful. you went, when you went to Hardy, you went to Hardy. Yep. Went to Hardy. And what did your, was your plan going in that you would be a counselor or did, did that come as, yeah. I, I've never asked you That's that. That's a great question. So when I got sober, I thought I know how to do two things really well. I know how to use drugs and to be a counseling client. That's it. That was one of my only skills. Because uh, <laughs> you had spent all that's those all I had years. done in my entire life. So eight, eight programs. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, I don't want to be a junkie anymore. I wonder if I could try my hand, you know, at counseling. Yeah. And the the counseling that made a difference in my life was Christian counseling. Yeah. And so I went to Harding University in Arkansas because they have a Christian based. Uh, marriage and family counseling program that I loved and I had an awesome cohort of students and I learned, you know, how to um, help heal the hurt that stands between people and Jesus so that they can get closer to him. And sometimes when I'm talking about the counseling profession, you know, it's kind of weird because the scriptures teach that our heart is deceitful above all things, you know? And so as a counselor, I'm kind of trying to get, people in touch with their heart and their inner world, which means I'm trying to help them kind of see where they're deceived and, you know, how their natural tendency is towards things that are just going to cause more destruction. But I think so often our culture tries to sell to us the idea that the answers lie within. And what I've learned over the years is that the answers don't lie within us. They, they lie in the, in the word of God. And that when we, when we, go on kind of a search inward, so to speak, we really do find the deception that's there. We find the brokenness that's there. It's not the answers that are there. It's all the pain and misery, but there really is a benefit 
to seeing what's there and to replacing lies with truth and talking through, you know, pain um, and allowing God to kind of heal some of that pain so that he can purify our hearts. Um, Well, that's, you know, my experience. Let's take another break. My experience with, in counseling with Lisa and I, and and primarily we went for both of us, but it was a lot for her. But we went in the first two times we went, she wasn't at that place yet. She hasn't yeah. been submitted yet. So like even going to a Christian counselor, ultimately there was no satisfaction with where we were because we weren't ready yet. And so I always say that my, from my experience, counseling is a fantastic guide, but only if you're willing to be guided. You bet. You know, mm-hmm. and so once you've made, so when we came in broken and ready because yeah. now we're ready for life change, our counselor was amazing because we were finally ready to go someplace and the counselor helped help get us. Thank there. God for that. Yeah. And so that from my experience and I, we, we've, you know, routed so many people to Christian counseling because we know what it did for us. It gave us a basis to start new from, and it changed our lives, you know, in, in, a, in a big way. And and I love the idea about your illustration of carrying the cross too, because you still need people in your life beyond that. You bet. When you face the temptation, when you face the difficulty, when you face some of the old, you know, things that used there, to attack. There's, a, the, you know, in terms of human attachment, this is another reason why I think counseling can be helpful and why the relationship we have with other Christians is so important. So in 1915, there's a, there was a pediatrician, his name was Henry Chapin. And, you know, so we're talking a hundred years ago. And so there were, there were a lot of people um, migrating to the United States and he worked in the Northeast part of the U S and he uh, had lots of babies that were not surviving their infancy. And so the mortality rate at the hospital he worked was incredibly high and he did a deep dive into the data and he was trying to figure out why are these babies not surviving? They had adequate food adequate shelter and adequate hygiene, but the fetal demise rate, it was something he could not improve. And so he's calling other hospitals, talking to other providers. And one day he just kind of decides I'm going to hire a lot more nurses to help me and see if we could get to the bottom of this fetal demise rate. So he adds a bunch of nurses to his staff and almost overnight babies start to survive and he hadn't changed anything. He just hired more staff Hmm. And so he starts to look at this phenomenon and he develops a hypothesis. I wonder if it has something to do with improving the caregiver to infant ratio. So he looks at other hospitals that have equally high fetal demise rates with some, with an unexplainable cause. It's not obviously like, you know, some bacterial infection circulating through the hospital. And so he, he repeats, uh, the process, the process. Yeah. Yeah. and he hires more nurses and in a couple of different times immediately the fetal demise rates improved and so he studies this phenomenon and what he eventually discovers is that as critical to life as adequate food adequate shelter and adequate hygiene is adequate human connection yeah. that yeah. was the difference that made the difference by improving the caregiver to infant ratio, he gave infants the chance to more deeply attach to their caregivers. Mm -hmm. And he called the diagnosis that he developed from this research failure to thrive. And this is a Mm -hmm. diagnosis we still use today um, in the medical field. What we used to think is that over time, a human being's need to connect diminished you know, as they become more independent and more autonomous. What we what we now know because of the work of a guy named John Bowlby is that your need to attach doesn't diminish over time the symptoms that arise as a result of being detached or what changes. Mm. But it's still a life-threatening phenomenon. Adults who are chronically detached, uh, Vivek Murphy, who was the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, published some research on this. You can you can Google it. Um, but he said that chronic detachment in adulthood is as detrimental to your health as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Wow. Yeah. So, so the first so, chapter of the Bible, it's not good for man to be alone. Jace, it's, 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 it's biblical you, truth. Yeah, how do you get exactly that right? right? That's exactly right. Which so science is catching up a lot up of the results of COVID, lockdown, all that, which this came out even more. 
when when that was being discussed. You know, for me, Trent, we realized that same theory must have come about because in the in the mid '80s when we had Anna, she was uh, she was born nine and a half week weeks wow. early. So normally that's time she's still in her mother's womb. You know, having that bonding. All of a sudden, we're watching all these. We're in a unit with premature infants. Yeah. And one of the things the nurses kept telling us was. It was so important to have a physical presence. We would we couldn't hold her because she had all these wires and tubes, but just to rub her body and just to talk wow. to her. That's and it. So yeah. we were there at every like we had four visiting hours a day, including one was one o'clock in the morning. They had these weird, but we were there for every one. I mean, like wow. because and then there was always a nurse there. So the idea Less was less than two pounds, right? Yeah, one wow. pound and fifteen ounces. But but their thing was she, her survival rate was going to be much higher the more time we were there to spend right. with her wow. and have that attachment. So it came probably from that same research, but Absolutely. they understood that. That's exactly And there was right. a nurse typically for every child that was in there. We did notice that some of the kids that didn't make it, and there were several, mm. usually we didn't see anybody there with that child. And the nurses were trying their best. But then we'd come in three days later and, that, and the bed's empty. And you know, it was just kind of a... You know, just a pall that goes over you because you realize that that may not have been just the reason. It could have been physical, but we know that that mattered. Alan, I think so. So for years when Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, and he says, uh, uh, love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've been a Christian for almost 19 years, but for probably 16, maybe 15, I've read those verses through the lens of devotion. And my interpretation has always been, Jesus is saying, give your entire life in devotion to God um, and give him everything you have and, and give everything you can to others. But about two or three years ago, I began understanding those verses through the lens of connection. Mm-hmm. And um, what we now know is that uh, connection has the ability to improve mental health and overall health in life than all other domains of life combined. Um, and so uh, Christians, I think, really have connection uh, uh, cornered um, because the core feature of connection is love. And love is the th- central theme of the scriptures. Yep. Mm-hmm. Love is God's core attribute, 1 John 4, 8. Uh, love's the most distinguishable feature of a disciple, John 13, Romans 12, I've often invited his living sacrifice is holy. Absolutely. Which is your spiritual act of worship. That's, Phil, it's exactly right. I, I, I also think, uh, what is it that covers a multitude of sins? It's right. love, 1 Peter 4, 8. Well, one point I wanted to say, just to prove your point. Hang on, Jess, let's take our last break. Prove your point is right. You know, one of the great benefits I get from being friends with uh, Trent is I get free counseling. And I, you know, my daughter, when she had gone through so much with all the surgeries and all, and so when she got to be, and she handled it way better yeah. than all of us. But when she got to be a teenager, all of a sudden, you know, we were having trouble and I couldn't, she was just disassociated. She seemed depressed. She, and, and, you know, we all go through puberty and, and all, so I just kept thinking it's that, but I was trying everything under the sun to connect with her. Nothing was working. So I called Trent and Trent in the moment, I thought this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard, but I didn't say that, but he's like, we ever <laughs> thought about, he says that for uh, most of the things I tell him. Well, it just <laughs> seems so he's like, we ever thought about, her having a counselor or talking to somebody about, and you gave an illustration. It's a lot like what she's gone through so much isolation, so much recovery because, because of so many surgeries Yeah, that all those times of loneliness and all is very difficult on them. And it's almost like a soldier having a post-traumatic war syndrome That's right. and because of the trauma that she's been through. And uh, even though I thought that's not it, I, I followed his, because I was willing to try anything. Yeah. So we had a weekend session, and I have to say, you know, I don't know exactly what was said during there, but but it did work through all that pain and suffering Thanks that God. she had gone through, and isolation. Yeah. That the lost connection where you have to take six months off of school while all your friends are at school, you're sitting there by yourself. 
And uh, even though the illusion was given to us that she's howling it well, of course, that's very difficult for a kid year in and year out to be beaten, butchered, and suffer and to be alone. And so, just the connection and the, that came from that conversation gave her heart a place to welcome Jesus mm. in that moment and and find her comfort in Him. And look, she's literally flourished ever since mm. after one weekend. And uh, so thanks for the advice. And you were right, but I think you have to sometimes realize that looking back to the old self, because that classifies as that, helped her realize, okay, that was tough, Mm -hmm. you know, and that was, and I should have been a little more vocal about, you know, all of that going on. And whatever the conversation was, it was just Mm -hmm. like, that's it. I'm moving on. I'm going to do this for the Lord. And it wasn't too long after that where she started using what happened to her. Because she saw a need yeah. wow. for other kids to say, I need this needs to be my ministry, you know, and that's when she took over her own charity and now, you know, runs that helping other people. Right. So I mean it it's it really the spirit of the Lord did it, but it was helpful mm-hmm. to have that connection and that counseling moment for all of us to be on the same page. And I think to keep that humility in us that we know we'll always need that. I mean, Trent has a tremendous expertise of what he's learned, but also what God has done in his life. But I remember, and I don't think I've ever shared this, Trent, but you and Kirsten one time were going through something and you yeah. got to an impasse with each other. And so here you are, you're a counselor. You, you, you probably knew all the right things to say and do, but you, but you wanted both of you to be on the same page. And so you called me and asked if Lisa and I would sit down with you guys. That's exactly right. And we did. And we talked through where you guys were and we prayed about it. And it, it was a good, it was a great, you you know, counseling guide for you. So even a counselor, Still well, needs counsel. So we're, all you know, we're, we're all That's human true. beings, you yeah. know. And I love that mm-hmm. humility about you, Jay, because yeah. you were our leader, but at the same time, we were helping lead you. Man, I, you know, and that's one of the things I love so much about Whites Free Road and the elders at Whites Free Road, which, as you know, Alan, I still consider the Whites Free Road elders, my elders and, and mentors, <laughs> you know, and shepherds. And it's like, I've kind of lived in two different sort of stratospheres, you know. I've been the just worst of the worst kind of an individual and you know now i'm in a lot of different leadership contexts but my need for connection with christ and my need for connection to other people who are christians has remained the same you know through through that whole time period and so um kirsten and i've been in a lot of counseling over the years anybody married to a guy like me uh, (laughs) has to be in lots of counseling you know she's wonderful but alan you're in lisa's guidance the guidance of our other elders you know at white's free road and and friendship with guys like jace you know uh has really been the difference that's made the difference, you know, for me. And again, I'll just go back to what I said earlier. I am not smarter than other people. I'm not a, a harder worker. I don't have, you know, gifts that are out of the ordinary. Because of the misery in my life, I've really come to terms with the fact that I have got to do life Jesus's way. Yeah. And I've got yeah. to have his people surrounding me. And yeah. that's yeah. really what uh, has, has, has given me the life, you know, that I've I've said this Sunday when I was preaching on Luke 15, when I got to the end of the text is that I, I've seen myself in all three of the Mm. people in the story. I was, I was the young son that that blew it like you did, but I've also been the older brother because I've looked judgmentally on others and not been willing to forgive. But also as I've gotten older and matured in Christ, I've been, I've had glimpses where I looked at people like the father looked yeah. at both of those sons in the story. And I think we could all say we've probably shared some time in the yeah. three characters and we want to be more like the dad. Which kind of brings us to what's going to happen. So, you know, the elders that you were bragging on got wind that you were coming. And so the next thing you know, they're like, well, we have a opening for a preacher Sunday. <laughs> By the way, three years later, I'm still temporarily filling <laughs> in right. for you, Trent. So that's right. you but I was gonna, this gaping <laughs> hole here at our I church. I was going to say, so you're going to preach on Luke 16, because I, I want to you know, encourage people to listen. But Al, uh, in our overtime of the last podcast, 
uh, Trent gave three A's that I had to give redneck interpretations because <laughs> he, like Zach, uses big words. So we had but, some cricket moments, Zach. But they were attachment, yes. which was the connecting to God, yep. you know, and other people. The acknowledgement. There was. A, there's a time you you know this you know going from the old self to the new self. These things have yeah. to. Occur. By the way, in my opinion, it's worth subscribing to Blaze to get that point because <laughs> yeah. it was so good. I looked three with. And the, then we had an actual. Uh, what was the last one? Actualization. Actual which I had no idea what that meant, but we we obviously what did we settle on? Uh, saying what that was, maybe something living in truth, living in you. Well, you realize, I guess the the benefits of yeah. You right. use John one as your text yep. that Jesus is the light. in him was life, right. and that life was the light of the world. Yeah, and you're so a servant to that, right? But yeah. Al, you had an aha three. I don't yep. know if you remember them off the top of your I head. I do, but I thought when Trent was sharing that his story. It sounded just like Luke 15. And yeah. you got to remember, you're at the table, with, been telling that story, and Phil talking about the blind. You're at that table that Jesus was eating with those tax collectors and sinners. He's eating with you. That caused him to tell those three stories. Because hmm. the religious people that day thought, well, why would you be with that bunch of losers? And uh, But you had that aha. So the aha was the, when he's in the pig pen, and it said he came to his senses. Yeah. This is from Kyle Adelman, by the way. Um, that's awareness. Now he's realizing where he's at. Then yeah. he says, I've sinned against God and against heaven. That was his humility because now he realizes who yeah. he's actually sinned against. Then it said he got up hmm. and he went to his father. That's action. Yeah. So that the aha moment is an awareness, a humility, and action. Absolutely. And that was your story. It's That's what totally you I thought those were similar. So with they that, really you're are. ready to do your sermon on Luke 16. Yeah. I was trying to help here. You know, <laughs> For sure. <CG. laughs> so since we're almost out of time, I guess in overtime, I do want to hear a preview since I will not be here. Uh, I have to, but of course, by the time this releases, it will be available for people to go watch, yeah. which is uh, uh, WFRChurch.org is where Trent's sermon is going to be. But I'm going to get it in the overtime segment to give us a preview of what he's going to be preaching about because you're actually picking up where I left off mm -hmm. in Luke 16, uh, which is a very powerful text. So, Trent, man, what a blessing to have you uh, here with us, um, to be with us this week. Your family is is so well loved here, and uh, you came back uh, last summer and preached for the first time, and it was great because it was like a homecoming. So it's gonna be fun for the folks to get to experience that again. But just thank you for all you do, brother. Love you guys so much. Thank you so much you for well. having me. All right, so we're gonna go to overtime. If you'll hear a little bit more with Trent, blazetv.com slash unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.